Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, July 18th. It hasn't always been smooth sailing um, with regard to transparency, that's for sure. How transparent and accountable are Chicago and Cook County governments? It's not going to be pretty, it's not going to be comfortable, but it's going to be the truth. A new task force aims to cut by 50% the number of women behind bars in Illinois. Looking at some mixed news about area home sales. If you graduate from college and you live in a quarters like this, it's pretty nice living. Are you single? Don't want to live alone? The rise of college dorm style co-living for adults in Chicago. Trouble was brewing in the world of craft beer when Chicago's Goose Island Brewery was bought by mega brewer Anheuser-Busch. A local writer details the fallout. Easy dip, sweet. And the commercial bread bakeries that set the stage for Chicago's favorite foods. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. The serial stowaway will stand trial. Eddie Arusa has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Eddie. Phil, Marilyn Hartman is out of jail tonight on a $10,000 bond and being electronically monitored. That comes after a Cook County judge ruled the 70-year-old is fit to stand trial. Hartman has repeatedly snuck onto airplanes and in one instance managed to fly from O'Hare to London without a ticket. She's been arrested several times with defense lawyers arguing she is not mentally competent. The conditions of her release include an order for her to stay away from any airports and train and bus stations. She will be housed at Safe Haven Foundation Recovery Center on Chicago's west side. Hartman faces a felony theft charge. Her next court appearance is scheduled for August 27th. An ex-Catholic priest who sexually abused boys at a west side parish will not be leaving a facility for the mentally ill anytime soon. A Cook County judge today ruled 49-year-old Daniel McCormick is still a sexually violent person who's likely to reoffend and ordered him to remain in the custody of the Illinois Department of Human Services. McCormick pleaded guilty in 2007 to the sexual abuse of five underage boys while he was a priest at St. Agatha Parish in North Lawndale. He was immediately defrocked and dozens of other allegations surfaced after his conviction. McCormick has been housed at a facility in downstate Rushville since 2009. And Judge Dennis Porter says while the ex-priest has followed the rules there, he's refused treatment. The Trump Organization was a deadbeat taxpayer between last year and this one. The Washington Post says the company, which is still owned by the President of the United States, failed to pay property taxes on time in Cook County and in at least four other states. The tardy taxes include those on the Trump Tower in downtown Chicago, as well as the more famous Mar-a-Lago Resort in Palm Beach, Florida. The Trump Organization blamed the missed deadline for its Chicago Tower on what it calls a clerical error. Records indicate the Trump Organization paid $61,800 in penalties, interest, and missed discounts because of the late payments. Well, one day after the Federal Communications Commu Commission raised red flags over the purchase of Tribune Media by the conservative-leaning Sinclair Broadcast Group, Sinclair says it will revise its filing. The FCC said it has serious concerns over Sinclair's plan to buy WG WGN-TV and 41 other radio and TV stations and then sell off some of them while continuing to run them. In WGN-TV's case, the filing said ownership would be transferred to an auto dealership in Maryland with ties to Sinclair's owner. The FCC move would have likely doomed Sinclair's purchase, but today the Maryland-based company said it will amend its divestiture plans to maintain ownership of WGN. If the FCC accepts Sinclair's changes, the nearly $4 billion deal could be completed later this year or early next year. As for the weather, mostly clear tonight with a low around 62. Then tomorrow, a slight chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms, otherwise mostly sunny at a high near 85. And a reminder that you have a number of ways of watching Chicago Tonight, including streamed on Facebook, via podcast and the PBS video app, or watch us online at WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight. And now, Phil, back to you. Thanks, Eddie. 
Chicago and Cook County have sometimes spotty reputations when it comes to how they run government operations, but they have taken steps to do a better job. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky is here with more. Amanda. Phil, Chicago has a strong community of journalists, also citizen advocacy groups, who keep an eye on government employees and elected officials. But there is a set of individuals who have an inside track. These guys, Oversight. the Inspectors General for Chicago Public Schools, the city itself, and Cook areas. County. It is literally their job to be the watchdogs, to follow up on whistleblowers' complaints. It's rare that they're in a room together, let alone on the proverbial hot seat as they were at the City Club of Chicago today. Given that reputation that you mentioned, you may be surprised to hear they had positive things to say. Well, Cook County has come a long way. There's no question since when I started in 2008, things were very dark in Cook County when it came to uh, information and supplying rationale for the why, why decisions were being made. Not to say there isn't a long way to go, but their very existence is a big step forward. These government oversight offices are relatively rare for municipalities. Illinois law doesn't require them. Cook County's Inspector General Patrick Blanchard says another bright spot came last year. Cook County Assessor Joe Berrios made headlines by refusing to cooperate with an investigation, but Blanchard says Berrios wasn't the only official to resist tendering records. A court decision now requires all 27 county elected officials, not just those under the umbrella of the board president, to comply. So Amanda, as you said, there's still a lot of work to be done. What is on that list? Well, City Inspector General Joe Ferguson has something specific. While he does have the power to investigate the city council, his office does not have oversight of several programs managed by the city council's finance committee like the workers' compensation system and the program that allows drivers to seek reimbursements for car damage. If you damage your car through a pothole, you can submit your claim through the city council. Um, so it's, it's those sorts of things um, that still are dark space. It's, a, it's, it's actually a, a, a relatively small portion of the overall city budget, um, but I think it's a symbolically important one. Ferguson was asked why those programs were exempt. Could it be that because the powerful finance committee is chaired by Alderman Ed Burke? I did not watch closely and was not part of any backroom discussions for parliamentary maneuvers that resulted in it. But yeah, that's, that's obviously what, what, the, what, what, the, what the elephant in the room was. We did reach out to Alderman Burke's office for a comment, but haven't heard back. So Amanda, what else is a concern? How else do these inspectors general say they could do their jobs better. What other tools do they need? Well, broadly budgeting, they want a minimum floor of financing, basically so that they can make sure that their operations are protected. Some also have more subpoena power than others. And then there's the matter of public transparency. Both Blanchard and Ferguson say governments too often do the bare minimum to comply with laws like the Open Meetings Act and the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA, resulting, they say, in a form of virtual obstruction. Okay. Lawyers got to do what lawyers got to do, but it's largely been co-opted by those with the information and the power to utilize through clever legal arguments, all sorts of variations on a core set of exemptions, some of those exemptions actually being really important. But the fact of the matter is, is that FOIA and litigation in FOIA is used to avoid disclosure of a lot of public information. The litigation process used as basically a blocking mechanism Amanda, how about the Inspector General for Chicago Public Schools? That office just took on a big chunk of a workload, a big agenda on the, on the table. Very much so. You're talking about fallout from a Chicago Tribune series detailing hundreds of cases of sexual abuse. Previously, CPS's law department handled those cases and allegations, or as critics may put it, didn't handle them. How can the law department, after all, both investigate and defend the district? Well, starting in October, allegations of sexual abuse will be handled by Inspector General Nicholas Schuler's office. He says one advantage of that is that sustained findings of abuse will be made public. People will know, uh, you know, the nature of, of what happened. They'll, they'll know what we recommended. They'll know what the board did. And so in, in some way, they'll know that it happened. The Inspector General's office is also tasked with looking back at more than a decade of previous sexual abuse cases. Schuller says his staff will nearly double in size to do that. 
So if you've wanted to investigate government from the inside, now's your chance. He's accepting resumes. Of course, the inspectors general for the city, county, and CPS can really only investigate certain types of wrongdoing. That often doesn't include behavior that's merely ethically questionable. I think that is one of the essential components of the, the narrative rut that we are in in Chicago and in Illinois with respect to ethics. Um, quite often the story is not what happens that is illegal, but what happens that's perfectly legal. And um, quite clearly, um, a lot of what is legal doesn't align with what the public's sense of, of, of what ethical behavior is, and that's something that we really need to be responsive to. In the near future, Ferguson says his office plans to unveil a dashboard of data so the public and government can work from a joint set of facts that will be online. Also, he says a management guidebook for city aldermen, whom he says historically haven't really been given that sort of support. Amanda, thank you. And out of Carol Marine and a bold goal for the criminal justice system. Carol. Phil, thank you. A new task force is aiming to cut the number of women incarcerated in Illinois by 50 percent. The task force is made up of 100 women, including former inmates, corrections officials, judges and prosecutors. Leading the initiative is Deanne Benos, former assistant director of the Illinois Department of Corrections, who is now the director of the Women's Justice Institute. She says at the Department of Corrections, she was unable to successfully advocate for women prisoners, but believes that now the political stars have aligned to make real change possible. And she joins us now. Deanne Benos, co-founder and director of the Women's Justice Institute. As I mentioned, you were previously an assistant director yes. at IDOC. Why couldn't you make the changes back in the day that you wanted to? Mm -hmm. and, and I'll first say that um, I've since learned that this is um, an experience that women across the country, um, as more women go into law enforcement agencies and corrections agencies are experiencing. Um, I happen to be the first woman appointed to the number two post to the Department of Corrections, so allegedly the second most powerful position. And what I found in that position is that whenever you would find, I would find similarities between challenges women face in society outside prison walls in spades behind them. So when I would raise issues, when we would raise issues about questions of sexual assault among the women inmates in the prisons, I remember distinctly a case at Dwight uh, Correctional Center where an issue was raised and I said, well, what are we gonna do about this? And I had former colleagues that were leading the women's division saying, we need cameras, we need these things. And I would sit in a meeting with high level men, the majority of men in, in, at the time in those decision making positions and rolling their eyes, oh, they always lie. You know women, they always lie. And then they would send in, you know, untrained young men, investigators to interview the women um, in hostile situations without drama informed uh, practices to ask the women, is it true, is it true? And you see that a lot even in society today with women that claim rape where they're, they're you know, I know Lisa Madigan's been leading efforts to make sure there's training in the way that women are questioned about their cases in society. You see similarities in systems and as a woman leading it and making that argument, I noticed that um, you would hear male officials say, ah, it's just a bunch of women, they're just whining, they're just emotional. Just con artists. Con artists, the whole thing. So. You're leading this charge mm -hmm. to try to, to diminish the women's population mm -hmm. by 50%. Mm -hmm. why, why just women, since women make mm -hmm. up such a small percentage mm -hmm. overall of people, men and mm -hmm. women, who are locked up? Mm -hmm. So there's a national Cut 50 movement started by groups like Just Leadership USA, the ACLU, and an organization founded by Van Jones called Cut 50. Um, all those organizations are wonderful groups um, fighting for gender neutral men and women cutting prison populations. But what you find, and even here Governor Rauner um, has a, a, a plan to reduce the prison population by 25%. But what you find is that in many advocacy movements, it's quite generic. And we aren't drilling into looking at the unique experiences of men women and men through the process. And over the years, it's proven that women have been eclipsed, their unique needs, what works with them, acknowledging that their pathways are disproportionately paved by sexual violence and abuse. More so than men. More so than men. When I mean, you think about it, 80% of reported cases across the country um, of, of rape and sexual assault are among women. 
Um, if you look at our prisons, 98% of women in prison today, according to the Criminal Justice Authority, have experiences with sexual assault and um, domestic violence, 75% with PTSD. And what about men? What's what their number? As far as men, I, I don't have the number for men, but I know nationally it's about 20% of the cases according to the same survey. It's 80% women, 20% men. Um, but I don't have the data as far as a, uh, the men in the prison system today and what they brought in. I, w I knew years ago in North Carolina a woman who was a warden mm -hmm. of both men's and women's institutions. Mm -hmm. And she said to me years ago, the culture in a women's prison mm -hmm. is radically different than the culture in a men's prison. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And what's the difference? Absolutely. So our organization brought the Department of Justice in um, a couple years ago, which led to this effort to conduct the largest assessment of a women's prison in the nation. And we brought formerly incarcerated women in with us to conduct it. And what we found is that you're bringing in women, disproportionately women of color, um, which it's still disproportionate among women of color, but white women are the fastest growing population in Illinois. Not that either is more compelling, but that's the case right now. You're bringing disproportionately women of color into a prison system where it's almost 90% or more white male officers that are not trained in trauma-informed practices or to deal with behaviors that confinement triggers when you bring a large number of women in that have experienced sexual violence and trauma into a confined setting. But let me be a devil's advocate mm -hmm. over at Stateville or mm -hmm. in some of the men's prisons. Aren't those same officers largely white and aren't mm -hmm. a high percentage of those men African American or men of mm -hmm. color and isn't that the same problem? Uh, no, it's not. Um, and when you look at it, if you think about it, if you have 80 percent of women in society that have been sexually assaulted. The vast majority have been assaulted by men. So when you take somebody and you put them into a setting of confinement where day to day their life and lock and key is controlled by men, what happens is, and, and this is a scientific issue, that triggers coping mechanisms of P PTSD and trauma. And those are unhealthy for women. They create uh, a safety situation for the woman and for others. Um, it doesn't make them violent persons, but those are unhealthy settings that do not work. And in fact, I've looked back I actually found something, records from prisons when the first woman went to prison in 1835 in Illinois. And account after account in records, one woman is more trouble to manage than 20 men. Well, guess what? We must be doing something wrong if 160 years later we still are getting the same comments from correctional officers. We focus grouped half of the correctional officers at Logan Prison. Women are more difficult. They talk too much. They're too emotional. And then it bears itself out with women getting as much as eight times the number of disciplinary tickets for discipline. So and when you were an IDOC official, these were some of the things that you came up against. And mm -hmm. what you seem to be saying, mm -hmm. that there's science behind this. This mm -hmm. isn't just yes. anecdotal. Yes. Yes, there is. And so what do you propose to do? So a couple things right now. So first of all, um, when I was at IDOC, the director before I left at the time thought it was silly. And at the time we had a women's division that mandated that practices be developed. A woman named Deb Denning used to run that and she was trying to grow those evidence-based practices. He took a pen and crossed it off a sheet of paper and said no more women's division and kind of demoted it. So we came back and passed a law that just took effect to mandate that all prisons and parole systems operate with science-based gender responsive is the word, trauma-informed and family-centered systems because 80% of the women are mothers in our systems, first of all. So we're going to be working to implement that. Their parents more than men in the... Women, in statistically, um, I think it's something like 75% of women were the custodial parent um, that lived with their children before they went to prison compared with 25% of men. And so that that's a that they are the, the caretaker often of their families. And what happens with women is that they're not only the caretakers going in, but when they come out because they were the caretaker, they get less help. They have less housing security. They are more economically marginalized. So they have it more difficult. Um, and what happens that we don't take into account is the impact on generational incarceration in their children and the young girls that end up in the foster care to prison pipeline and boys as well. So women, you know, they might be a smaller population and sometimes corrections officials argue, oh, it's only 8%, it's no big deal, it's just a bunch of women. But it, it's, it's not worth the investment, but it is. It's, we're proving we can't afford not to invest in them. So in how do areas. you reduce the prison population 
in Illinois of women by 50%? A couple things. So first of all, prison populations are governed by two things, right? admissions from counties, and then length of stay. So when we start looking at policies and practices, our research showed that tens of thousands of days were added to women's sentences for disciplinary violations when there's PTSD, um, PTSD episodes within the prison. We tried an administrative pilot in the last year that reduced by some 30,000 days that were taken from women, they were no longer being taken away just in, in a year period. So we were actually able to do that. We'd like to make that pol um, that policy permanent and look so more deeply. So it shrinks deeply. the sentence, gets them out right. sooner. You also see women, again, disproportionately impacted by gender-based violence, that often there's those practices in police stations sometimes where a DV call, a domestic violence call is called in, where a woman gets arrested with the man, even if she called it, like people will come in depending on what situation erupted. Well, if that woman doesn't even commit a a violent crime and she commits a drug crime and she goes to prison and she's hoping to access credits so that she can earn programming credits or get out earlier to reunify with her family. The Department of Corrections traditionally will look and say, oh, there's a domestic violence arrest. You're not eligible. So you're a violent so not, offender. That Exactly. You're a vi even if that's not the offense you went in for. And so now taking a second look from a gender lens is what is holding women back from getting out? Why are they staying longer? Why are they being denied opportunities for these kinds of, of activities? Is another other area. Then we start looking at areas like front end court admissions. We have seen court admissions go down in places that are largely driven by Cook County because it's the largest county, so it carries the biggest, you know, hit on the I mean, in other averages. words, they get bond as opposed to being put into the jail? Yes, but what our researchers showed today from Loyola University, Dr. Dave Olson and Amanda Ward, is that a large volume of the population hit to the Department of Corrections for women and men has been reduced arrests. And that's a practice, it's not a permanent policy. So we're, it's great that we're riding on that in Chicago, but in 46 counties, we have seen women's populations spike, and that's part of a national trend. So the way we see it is that we gotta pay close attention, just relying on arrest, and there's some wonderful things being done by Tony Preckwinkle and Kim Fox and Amy Campanelli that, that are, are taking Who's hold with Who's the public defender, who is the Cook County together. State's Attorney, and Tony Preckwinkle Absolutely. in the county. Do you think the public's gonna be sympathetic to this? I do. I do, and I think our, the name of our campaign for this is called Redefining the Narrative because it's about redefining the narrative about how we see justice. You know, what is justice? What is justice? You know, where I wear two hats. I work on the rape kit backlog issue, and what I see is that one of three, one of three rapists will ever spend a day in prison, but we're saying that the fastest growing prison population across the country are women and girls that have experienced that violence and we, can spend, we can't afford to spend time to invest in a rape kit backlog or preventing sexual violence, but we have plenty, billions to invest in prisons. We have to start looking at evening the scales and making changes, and that's why we brought together a broad-based coalition to do this. Um, and it, it's not gonna be easy. It's not a silver bullet or a, a check. You know, We're gonna spend this year digging into the data, finding solutions, and understanding what's happening in our communities. And you believe this is a movement? It's, it's, it's not a moment, it is a movement. So that's what we'd like to make happen. Deanne Benos, thank you very mm -hmm. much for joining us on Chicago tonight. Thank you. There's much more ahead. Stay with us. Still to come out of Chicago tonight, the rise of college dorm-style living for young Chicago professionals in the Fulton Market District. A journalist recounts the controversial sale of Chicago's Goose Island Brewery to a beer industry goliath. And we have some fun on a bun in commercial bakeries that make the bread for two iconic Chicago foods. But first, Chicago is still the second city when it comes to foreclosures. And on the other end of the real estate spectrum, luxury property sales are booming. Here with both those stories is Crane Chicago Business residential real estate reporter Dennis Rodkin. Dennis, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Hi, Phil. So first of all, Chicago ranks second. Only New York 
uh, surpassed in Chicago in terms of foreclosures. What is going on? Well, first of all, that's an improvement. We did have the highest number years ago, uh, 2012 through 14, we were the highest. So being number two is actually an improvement. We're behind uh, Philadelphia if you count it one way and New York if you count it another way. We can get to that. What's going on at this point is several foreclosure experts have said to me in the past year that at this point, this has very little to do with the housing crash of 11 years ago. What this has to do with uh, is especially in South Cook County, places where home values continue to either not improve or go backward. Uh, and unemployment was also high in these areas. So there are a lot of people who, after years of waiting for the home to catch up, have said, I'm done, mm. I'm done. I'm, I need to move west for a job. Uh, my parents have died and we can't sell the house they lived in, whatever it is, and they let go of the homes. So what we have, several people have said, we now have more of a structural problem than we have a, an incidental problem, a problem that comes from that one crash. We have uh, serious trouble, especially in South Cook County, in areas that are failing to recover. I see. Uh, that leads to another question, and that is, uh, oftentimes uh, during, the, during the housing crisis and homes were in foreclosure, uh, oftentimes people would line up to buy some of these foreclosed right. homes. But you're, is, is that happening to any extent in those areas? It is happening. Actually, I have a story coming out tomorrow talking about we've been looking at this sort of foreclosure rehab wave. Flippers have been buying in city neighborhoods and various suburbs, and it keeps creeping farther out, in part because a lot of the closer in the city foreclosures have been mopped up, but also because, because they have been mopped up, the prices are rising. So now flippers are going to places like Maywood and Dalton and Harvey and buying up the foreclosures. And th there have been tens of thousands of foreclosures uh, rehabbed and resold by flippers in the Chicago area, South Side, West Side, and those sub the South suburbs. And that's a great thing because a lot of these homes would have sat unrepaired for years longer. If I bought it at a, as, a, as a homeowner, I probably couldn't afford to fix it up. But the rehabbers come in, fix it up, and they create this sort of almost a self-perpetuating cycle. I sell one really well-rehabbed product, uh, home and it means that other people are willing to rehab and as and to buy that finished rehab. Let's uh, move on and talk about the inventory of houses available in the city. My understanding is it's not good. Uh, what's what, what is going on there? You know, it's it's amazing. The the number of single family homes, no, we're not counting condos and townhouses, hit a record low in late 2017 and has not risen. There's been this flat line of the number of houses for sale. Part of it is that a lot sell before they really even go on the market because they're sold through private listings and that sort of thing because it, low inventory sort of breeds low inventory. But another is that a lot of people can't afford to put the house on the market. I'm underwater and I can't afford what it would take to get back to zero in order to sell, or I can't afford the jump to the next house, so I stay in the one I'm in and don't list my house for sale. You say low inventory begets low inventory. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, well, be because their inventory has been so tight, a lot of agents are selling things before they ever even put them on the market. I go out and prospect a neighborhood and say, would you sell your house if I had a buyer for you? You say yes, I connect you with a buyer, and it never actually goes on the open market. Uh, but uh, my understanding is that there's, a, because people are not putting, some people are not putting their houses on the market because they're, uh, they're, concerned, uh, they're concerned about values and that sort of thing. And as a result, uh, not only do they not put their houses on the market, but they're not looking for other houses. But they're not buying another one. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, you write that home sellers need to be, a real, be realistic. In what way? Well, one of the things, so inventory is tight, prices are going up. But inventory isn't so tight and prices aren't going up so much that you can, you know, your neighbor sold for 100, so you say, then I'll sell for 120. Most likely you can't. You're more likely to sell for 105. Um, and a lot of, there are a lot of sellers, especially at the upper end of the market, who think everything I put in that house, I should get back plus some profit. And generally, that's not where the market is. Mm. Uh, are home values improving? They seem to be. They're going up. We uh, The June information for the whole market will be out next week, but prices have been going up in most of the of the region on sort of a, a region-wide basis, but it's spotty. There are pieces of the suburbs where they're still sort of failing to rise. Um, for example, what suburbs? 
Well, a lot of the far west suburbs, mm -hmm. uh, much of the North Shore prices have started to sort of lose a little bit of air in the last year. Those are two of the big, big regions. Well, let's talk about uh, the high end of the real estate market. And on the luxury end, things are, things are booming. Yeah, it's kind of, a, it's sort of, we have had this two-track recovery for a long time. And so I talked about uh, places where prices aren't going up, foreclosures are uh, numerous. But at the upper end of the market, it's going nuts. We have, as of June 30th, there were, uh, at, let's put it this way, as of June 30th, 2017, the highest priced home sale in the region was 7.2 million. As of June 30th, 2018, there were 10 homes that had sold for more than that amount already. There were four that had sold for 10 million or more. So again, 7.2 at mid-year last year, four of them at 10 million or more this year. My Ten, that, well, that's, that, that's remarkable, yeah. and yet, uh, in spite of those numbers, uh, my understanding is that the, that the most active part of the luxury market right. is, is between what price points? About a million and a million five. Um, and what's interesting is in a lot of places, a million dollar home is not a luxury home anymore. But when you just look at our entire region, a million dollars is sort of a good cutoff for luxury homes. So even though luxury sales at the end of the first half of the year were up 10% over the year before, but sales of the market overall are down two percentage points. So there's about a 12 percentage point gap between what's happening in the luxury market and the market overall. But when you look at prices, as you say, the prices are lower. Those very high, except for these $12 million sales I'm talking about, um, there are a lot of homes that are selling in that million to a million five range and fewer above that. Part of that is because so much new construction in the city starts at a million dollars. You have written that uh, many expensive homes are selling for less than what owners paid for them or less than what they were listed for. Uh, give us some insights into why that is. Well, um, that's because our market, we, we have people leaving, right? We, have, uh, we just haven't had the boom that a lot of other cities have had. Almost every day I tweet about a house that has sold, especially a high-end house that has sold for less than one or two of its previous sales. And I've had several. Uh, there was one in Lake Forest recently. The CEO of a, of a company in, in uh, the north suburbs sold a house this year for less than he paid for it in 1998. Some of that is that the attraction of living on the North Shore and the, far, the, the high end suburbs isn't as great as it was in 1998 because a lot of people who are buying the very high end homes are buying the condos downtown or single family homes, more often the condos. So there's just a little bit less excitement in the suburbs than there is in the city and that brings prices down. Speaking of condos in the city, a uh, condo in the unbuilt Vista Tower sold for $18.5 million. Can you describe that condo? Uh, it's big. It's not yet built. It doesn't exist. <laughs> um, the building there, there, they have built up to the 60th. Uh, the floor is in the 60s and this is in the 70s. So the condo doesn't actually exist, but it's two floors. It was offered as two individual floors and the buyer apparently has combined them. It's over 10,000 square feet. It has a, an outdoor or will have 10,000 square feet, we'll have an outdoor terrace of about two, uh, I think 4,000 square feet. An outdoor terrace of 4,000 square feet? Up in the 70th, yeah. Wow. So you'll be looking, they, as that rendering of the building showed, and as we know, the Vista Tower is gonna be this 101 story building near the lakefront on Wacker Drive. So from that terrace, they'll be looking south over like probably all the way to Kentucky, north up into Wisconsin, and across Lake Michigan. Uh, you alluded to this uh, figure just a second ago. Another property in Lake Forest sold for $12 million, but would you call this an outlier in Lake Forest? Because there seems to be a surplus of high-end homes. The, what are we looking at here, by the way? This is the driveway. That's, the, that's all I could see from the street. Um, it's a multi-acre property on uh, the lake in Lake Forest. Couldn't get a lot of detail. In fact, it was a very quiet sale. It never showed up in, in the records where most of these show up. So it was about five months after the sale that I found it. $12 million. It's an outlier uh, in one important way. Nothing has sold for 10 million or more in Lake Forest since 2007. And here we are in 2018 when the next ones, there, there were multiples. There were, I think, three in 2007, two in 2006, nothing. And then this one in, in uh, 2018. Dennis Rodkin, thanks for the update. Always fascinating. Thanks, Phil.
And speaking of housing, some people who go to college just don't seem to want to leave. Now some developers in Chicago are playing to that demographic. A growing number of young professionals who are moving here may have gotten a degree in something, but they have yet to graduate from other aspects of college life. Parashutz has that story. Sure, it may feel like a college dorm. There's a game room, a large common area, and small living units. But the residents here all have jobs. It's a new co-living facility called Quarters in the Fulton Market District. One of the yeah, residents, Riley Rather, is a chef at Grant Ackett's Aviary Restaurant. He recently moved here from California and says there are times where he is working nonstop. Um, it can be five, six, maybe seven days a week sometimes. As a result, Riley said he wanted minimal responsibility at home. Quarters units come furnished with dishware, furniture, and even bed sheets. It's like a weight that's lifted off your shoulders. Like you don't have to worry about finding an, a department store somewhere that has these low-end appliances and stuff that are going to break in a couple of months. The rents in the facility start at $1,200 for a room and shared kitchen, slightly below market value for a studio apartment in the neighborhood. For those who want an entire apartment, the rents top out above $3,000 a month. All utilities, including a Netflix account, are included. The point is trying to create living space, co-living space, that someone can afford, but also adds the amenities of the area of where they want to live in. The company officially opened the co-living space earlier this summer and says the idea is to piggyback off of co-working spaces like 1871. You have people that either work in the tech industry or work in the food industry or work in retail, but they want to be social too and they want to have friends and they don't want to just go home at night, shut their door, not see anyone until the next day when they go to work. Co-living is in a bit of a regulatory gray area in the city. It's not exactly affordable housing, and it also doesn't qualify as home sharing like Airbnb or VRBO. Quarters makes residents sign leases for a minimum of three months, but after that they're free to get out any time they'd like. The three-month stipulation means they are not subject to home sharing taxes that the city has levied on services like Airbnb. Most older people we spoke to said that they have heard of the co-living concept, but they hadn't had a chance to vet what regulations would be suitable. The company says they are looking to aggressively expand in Chicago. Quarters wants at least 10,000 beds in the city in the very near future. So we are looking at different wards, different areas already, with eyes on expanding immediately. Potential residents have to apply to get in, although there is no age limit or preferred occupation. Residents may just want to remember to keep their rooms clean when Parents Weekend rolls around. For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Schutz. Quarters also has locations in New York and Berlin. There's more information on our website. Don't miss a Chicago Tonight story. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to our morning newsletter. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight email and sign up. It was big news when the Anheuser-Busch InBev company bought Chicago's Goose Island Brewery back in 2011. But was it a great American success story or an epic sellout? The journalist who broke the story in the Chicago Tribune has now written a book about that acquisition. It is called Barrel Age Stout and Selling Out, Goose Island, Anheuser-Busch, and how craft beer became big business. And we are pleased to welcome Josh Noel to Chicago tonight. Josh, good to have you here. Great to be here. Thank you. Uh, but when did you sense that there was a book-length story to tell about this acquisition, which got a lot of attention at the time? Uh, about the time of the acquisition. <laughs> I, Goose Island was always one of the most fascinating breweries in uh, the rise of American craft beer. Uh, no two ways about it. Uh, however, they, they didn't quite perhaps become a book-length story unto themselves until they sold Anheuser-Busch, uh, which was a lightning rod of a sale, caused a lot of consternation, cries of sellout. Uh, but it made sense on the Goose Island side, it made sense on the Anheuser-Busch side, but a lot of people were upset about it too, and so I thought it would, was worth digging into all those different threads and uh, figuring out how it, how it came together. Let's go back to a point you made early in that statement, and that has to do with the prominence of Goose Island. Why was Goose Island such a big deal? Because here in Chicago we thought, well, it's a big deal, but uh, when, when, uh, when a local store becomes uh, national, sometimes those of us who live 
where that story emanates from, don't necessarily have a full appreciation. Why was Goose Island such a big deal nationally? Uh, innovation, in a word. Uh, Goose Island was ahead of a lot of trends. Goose Island helped lead the way for American craft beer. Uh, when Goose Island started in 1988, there were about 200 breweries in the U.S. Now there are nearly 6,500. And along the way, Goose Island invented beer styles. Goose Island was uh, among the first to adopt practices more common in Europe, very uncommon in the United States. It's just Goose Island was at the forefront of a, of a, lot, of, a lot of trends. And those trends... And ended them well, I should say, too, mm. very well. Those trends uh, really took off in the 80s and 90s. How did so-called big beer uh, react to the emergence of this uh, craft beer phenomenon? It was a problem. <laughs> it was a problem for them. Uh, back in the day, you, you were a Bud guy, you were a Miller guy, you were a Schlitz guy, whatever it was. You had the one beer you drank, and that was pretty much how we drank beer in, in America. Uh, with the rise of craft beer, with the rise of imports, people began to drink different sorts of beers for different sorts of occasions. And uh, we, we became... Uh, just a different sort of beer drinker than we had been a generation earlier. And Big Beer had to adjust to that. And at first they thought craft beer was something that would go away, and it didn't. So then they realized they needed to get involved. They tried to make their own brands. That didn't work because it really had no authenticity, which is a big part of the craft beer movement, story, authenticity, uh, connection with the customer. Big Beer couldn't create that itself, so they had to by the likes of Goose Island, and then they went on and bought nine more American craft breweries, and uh, now Anheuser-Busch is poised to become the biggest manufacturer of craft beer in the United States. That's a real irony, isn't it, that big beer all of a sudden has sort of, for want of a better term, co-opted the craft beer movement. Uh, a little more, and you've touched on this a little bit, but a little more on why the fans of Goose Island thought, this is heresy. Yeah. Um, Craft beer has a, a very unique relationship with its consumer. Uh, as I said, it's built on authenticity, it's built on relationship, it's built on intimacy, uh, and the craft breweries depend on that with their customers. Uh, once you've established that relationship, and then you turn around and sell that, basically that relationship to the biggest beer company in the world, those, uh, your, your longtime fans get a little upset. Uh, some, I've heard craft beer compared to uh, like sports teams and, the, and sort of the, the fandom that people have mm. for them. It's, just, it's a really unique and intense relationship, different than we have with most other uh, Products. packaged goods, exactly. Sure, sure because in this case, uh, I mean, the, the loyalty actually involves ingesting it into your body. Right, literally. <laughs> I mean, if you really want to get deep about it, yes, this is, and, but still, we don't, tend to have this kind of relationship with, um, you know, with our juice necessarily, no. you know, I mean, or our, our, uh, our protein bars, you know, even though we put those in our body, but there's something about beer. It's, you know, it's the, it's, uh, I've heard it described as the pubs are the original social media, you know, that's where you would go to hear the news of the day and, you know, chat and get a little rowdy and have fun and, and that, you know, beer is just, it's a, it's a social lubricant unlike power bars, you know, and that's, <laughs> right. that's why it resonates so deeply with uh, You with talk people. about how alienated uh, a lot of Goose Island's customers were, uh, and you write about the reaction of the employees of the brewery. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Uh, it was, the sale was stunning for a lot of people. Uh, there were a few, uh, pieces of evidence that perhaps, you know, looking back that, oh, it, it makes sense. But it was still a really stunning day in 2011 when this, when this sale went down. Uh, and there were literally Goose Island employees standing in the warehouse hearing the announcement of the sale, texting people at other breweries saying, hey, c I'm, I'm done here. Can I come work for you? And a lot of those people, to be fair, did it, you know, they cooler heads prevailed, they, they ended up sticking around for a little while. But then there has been almost complete turnover amongst the brewers at Goose Island uh, since the sale. Uh, to a degree that's going to happen naturally, you know, there's turn turnover in a brewery, but also that has been, the brewery has been sort of reinvented as a hybrid of Chicago's Goose Island crossed with global Anheuser-Busch InBev. It is now very much a hybrid of the two. In, in terms of the product, has the, has the product changed? I mean, has the quality been affected or I, that, its you uniqueness? Know, that's, uh, everyone can draw their own conclusion. I think it's safe to say yes. It uh, has changed in your opinion? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, Goose Island IPA was a very well-regarded beer. 
uh, when it was made here in Chicago, won a lot of awards. Now it's made by Anheuser-Busch in the same tanks, literally, as Bud and Bud Light. Really? Yeah, and uh, same with 312 Urban Wheat Ale. It's, not a sh it's a Chicago beer in name only now. And again, it's made in New York and in Colorado by Anheuser-Busch. And uh, yeah, both those beers are really a, a shadow of what they used to be. Uh, the founder of Goose Island, John Hall, mm -hmm. did he cooperate with you? He did. We sat down for many interviews together. Um, you know, I don't think he completely knew what the book was going to be. I didn't completely know what the book was going to be. And the truth is, is that the story evolved. I, when I began working on the book, Anheuser-Busch had bought one American craft brewery, Goose Island. They went on to buy nine more uh, across the country. And as I say, now they're poised to become the largest manufacturer of craft beer in the U.S. So the story really wound up changing. And the Goose Island story wound up telling a uh, far, far broader story than just its own. It wound up telling the, the story of American craft beer, really. And give me a bullet point on what Hall's response was. Uh, what's his perspective on all this? And the, on, the reaction uh, of the drinkers, the reaction of his employees? John's a, John's a very savvy, smart guy. And he knew immediately that he was going to, that there would be some intense reaction. He knew he would lose some people, maybe within the brewery, uh, maybe among drinkers, but he always knew that he would gain far more, cu well, that I should say, not he, because he sold the business, that Goose Island would gain far more customers than they would lose. And of course, he was right. Goose Island is now available in all 50 states. There are, there's a Goose Island brew pub in London, in China, in Australia, in Brazil, in Mexico. I mean, it's, it's the global American craft brand for the biggest beer company in the world now. Did he, did, he, did he get a pretty good deal out of it? I mean, given where, where, the, uh, where the brand is now? Uh, pretty good. Uh, he, he sold the company for $38.8 million. He didn't get all that because um, he you know, owned a fairly small stake when you divvy it up with shareholders and everything. Um, a brewery out of San Diego, Ballast Point, sold a couple years back for $1 billion. So 38.8 versus a billion. Some people say that Goose Island sold for far too little. Uh, it's always struck me that someone had to go first. And if you're first, then that's when the valuations are probably going to be lowest in the industry. And th they went up as a result of Goose Island. So Ballast Point and all these other brewery owners who became far richer than John Hall did should send John Hall a thank you note. <laughs> Does it matter who owns a craft beer company? I would say yes. Uh, if if uh, there is that intense relationship between fan and, uh, and manufacturer, then yeah, I think who the manufacturer is does matter. And as we discussed, the quality of Goose Island IPA of 312 Urban Wheat Ale has changed in the hands of Anheuser-Busch, and that's because of the sale. Uh, that said, Goose Island also makes some very fine beers here in Chicago still. Um, so there's, there's no one answer, but uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it matters. But you know, and to some people it doesn't matter, and that's fine. So uh, g given uh, your opinion that uh, some of Goose Island's flavors or brands have, uh, have gone down in quality, which ones are you recommending now? Uh, I still think Matilda is a great beer that's made by Goose Island here in Chicago. Sophie is another Goose Island beer still made here in Chicago. It's wonderful. Uh, Bourbon County Stout, which is referenced in the title of the book, Barrel Aged Stout and Selling Out. And that's a style of beer, Imperial Stout aged in bourbon barrels, which Goose Island essentially created. Uh, Bourbon County Stout is still a world-class beer, big and boozy, and just it's an, it's an occasion unto itself. Josh and Well, thank you for uh, helping us to make an occasion here with your being our guest. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Much. Again, the book is Barrel Aged Stout and Selling Out, Goose Island, Anheuser-Busch, and how craft beer became big business. You can read an excerpt on our website. And we're back with more right after this. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. Once upon a time, our daily bread was baked at home, mainly by women. 
But when they began working outside the home in increasing numbers, the home and industrial food manufacturing became commonplace. Commercial bakeries began to rise in Chicago. And as European immigrants brought and adapted their food traditions here, some of those bakeries began making breads just for the Chicago market. Jay Shevsky recently brought us this story, and here is another look. Is there anything Chicagoans love more than hometown foods? Take, for instance, the beloved Chicago-style hot dog. On an average day at Wolfie's in Rogers Park, co-owner Gus Romas says they sell between 150 and 250 hot dogs. And while not all of those hot dogs get the Chicago-style treatment... Mustard, relish, onion, tomato, pickle, hot peppers, and celery salt. The poppy seed bun is the undisputed choice of stage for that garden of delights. Aficionados say it adds a subtle nutty flavor to the dog. As far as I can tell, it's the only way to serve a Chicago hot dog. It's always been a poppy seed bun. Like many other Chicago stands, Wolfie's nestles its hot dogs in S. Rosen's poppy seed buns baked by the Alpha Baking Company in the Hermosa neighborhood. But the biggest piece, the staple of what we do here is hot dog buns. Alpha's website says over 90% of Chicago area stands use their buns. There's competitors out there, but really, I, I, I think I have the Cadillac of hot dog buns. Every day, the ovens in Alpha Baking's compact facility produce more than 150,000 poppy seed hot dog buns. The typical dough mass that we make weighs around, let's say, roughly 2,000 pounds. And out of that, we get roughly 14,000 hot dog buns by the 2,000 pound dough, 900 pieces a minute. Fun stuff. The whopping blob of dough gets portioned, shaped, and plopped into baking trays. A steamy journey through a proofing box puffs them up before they get a generous shower of poppy seeds. The going joke is that back in the day, we used to have an individual who would place the poppy seeds on by hand, and then we would count the poppy seeds by hand. The seeded buns are baked for seven minutes and circle the bakery's ceiling on racks to cool. Then the buns are sliced and packaged in a variety of ways, including boxes designed especially for Chicago hot dog stands, where buns get a sauna treatment before they're loaded up. This will hold the life in a steam table. In, a, in the box, it'll, it'll last longer because it's got protection from the bottom. And the bun steams up beautiful, and you get that nice Chicago hot dog, nice soft bun. S. Rosen's, started in 1909, is the primary retail brand of Alpha Baking, which operates multiple bakeries in the Chicago area. Chicago's years as a grain milling powerhouse and a turn-of-the-century immigrant boom created an ideal environment for the commercial baking industry to rise. Among the oldest bakeries still operating today in the Chicago area is the Ganella Baking Company, which started as a small bakery on DeCoven Street in 1886. One Chicago favorite, often served on Ganella bread, has developed its own ordering vocabulary. Beef pot, beef easy dip, sweet. The Italian beef at Roma's rides inside six inch portions of Ganella loaves that start out three feet long. Restaurants like Roma's prefer the unusual length for easy and consistent portioning, and the loaf's sturdy crust allows the sandwiches to survive a gravy dunk. A lot of Chicagoans like their Italian beef wet, so you want a nice crispy crust there to begin with so that it'll hold up to that dipping process. Roma's co-owner Fred Rafiti says he relies on that hearty crust to support the 170 or so beefs his restaurant serves up each day. It holds the beef, you can dip it. It's got the wonderful flavor. We've been here since 1968 and always use Ganella ever since. Despite the name, Italian beefs are Chicago originals. They're an invention of the city's Italian immigrants and for the most part, a sandwich you can only get in the Chicago area. Ganella's history in Chicago is as long as these loaves, thanks in large part to Italian beefs. Our customers have been buying the same product for us in basically the same form 
since they opened their doors. And some of those situations go back to the 1930s, 1940s. At their bakery in Aurora, Ganella produces 2,800 of what they call the extra-long French loaf every hour and delivers them fresh to restaurants in the wee hours of the morning. Even though the process has become significantly more modern, Ganella still does some things the old way. The loaves are portioned and stretched mechanically before they're laid onto a bed of cornmeal scattered over wooden peels and put into line with one final stretch done by hand. Like the poppy seed buns, the long loaves are particular to the Chicago market, and they too get special packaging. We still package the bread in an old-fashioned brown paper bag. It allows the bread to continue to cool, and we want to attain a crispy crust for our French bread, so that's why we don't put it in plastic. So the next time you dive into one of Chicago's messy, meaty treats, spare a thought for their Chicago bread vehicles that make them so neat to eat. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. You know, we really need to develop smell vision There's more on this story on our website. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily e-alert. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. An update from Chicago immigration attorneys on migrant family reunification. And African-American sailors making inroads in a traditionally white sport. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce, and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.